Okay. So um, I, I, have, I have a few photos here from a long time ago. Um, this was a photo in 1974. It was right after I got my PhD. And it was at a scientific meeting. And uh, this is a group of people. We we're sitting in a restaurant. This is a group of people. Uh, we were all more or less working in uh, the same research area. And um, uh, I, you know, uh, I don't even know if I remember everybody's. This is Jim Fenup. I still know him. I usually ask people to pick me out. Sometimes they assume that this is me. It's not. This is this is Wai Han Lee. He's uh, he was at Xerox. This is uh, oh Jim Fenup was at Stanford. Xerox. This is uh, David Chu. He was uh, also at Stanford. This guy is Haskell. I don't remember his first name. He was at a university, I think in Michigan, called Oakland University. And this is me. So you probably wouldn't recognize me uh, if I didn't tell you that was me. Um, like I said, 1974, right after I got my PhD. Uh, I mentioned last class I had been in uh, Kyrgyzstan before. And I and I happen to have a few photos of that, and um, so there, that's me. And um, if you're from Kyrgyzstan, you might recognize this location. It's Ala Archa National Park outside of Bishkek, and uh, the photo was taken in the summer. And um, like I said, I. It was about 37 years ago. You know, I, I don't exactly remember the year anymore, but the Soviet Union was still going strong. And I believe that Gorbachev was uh, was running the show at that time. Um, here's another photo. I think that was in um, Moscow Airport or one of the, or two Moscow airports, and this was one of them. We we're getting ready to get on an Aeroflot flight uh, to go to uh, Frunza. What I remember, I remember two things about that Aeroflot flight that surprised me. One is that um, walking down the aisle, the floor bounced. In other words, it didn't seem to have a lot of support underneath. And then the other thing uh, I remember was uh, when we were flying in, we flew over the RLC or what was uh, what remained of it at, at that time. And um, I remember when the plane landed, I'm, I was used to in the United States when the plane landed, all the customers, passengers got off first, and then the flight crew got off. But that's not what happened with Aeroflot. The plane landed, and all the customers had to stay in their seat while the captain and co-pilot and whatever got off the plane first. So a little bit different custom there. I have a few, uh, let's see, a few more pictures here. This was a, a, a group of us. Um, who were at the meeting in Bishkek that was organized by Akayev. And um, here's me. Um, this fellow is a very, was a very famous uh, uh, Soviet scientist. Uh, Yuri Denizuk was his, it was his name. I'm sure he's not still alive. And, um, uh, and then there was a you know, collection of people from all over. Uh, this guy was Russian. This guy was Chinese. This fellow was, I believe, a graduate student of Akayev. Um, and uh, so, um, a mix of other people here. 
This was my friend. Uh, a, he was Russian at the Soviet Academy in Moscow. And uh, name was Leonid Yaroslavsky. And uh, he visited me in the United States uh, for a while, too. He was, I li really liked him. He was a good guy. Um, we went uh, hiking in uh, Ala Archa, and I have a couple photos there. Let me see. Here we were hiking up a mountain, and uh, we hiked up to, this was in the summer now. I, I forget exactly if it was June or July, but I think it was June. But so we hiked up to the snow. This is the snow. So we hiked, hike, this so we, is in the summer, we hiked up to the snow. And uh, I remember the sun was really strong and bright. And uh, somebody made me a paper hat here. I, I guess that's a, a skill that uh, Kyrgyz learn in school, making these paper hats. Um, and uh, what I remember, uh, I wasn't used to the altitude at that time. And uh, this old guy right here was from Soviet Georgia. So he was, he had a wooden leg. And then in addition to that, from Georgia, I get, he was used to the, uh, the mountains there. So he was used to the altitude. And I, I believe he was in his 70s at that time. Me, I was in my 30s. And um, he was in the 70s. And he was just, as we were hiking up that mountain, he was going strong. And I wasn't used to the altitude. So I, I was, you know, becoming, I was losing my, my breath because, uh, because of the low oxygen compared to where I lived. And I was determined not to let this old guy with a wooden leg beat me up. So I, I can remember uh, really pushing myself and be and hurting because I was trying to keep up with this old guy here. And uh, here, uh, here is the graduate student again. So this is a interesting group of people. Here's a young kid here who was going up the mountain. And uh, so um, now let me come back to that previous photo for a moment. I don't know if you see enough of the background here to recognize the location. I'd be interested in knowing exactly where that was in Bishkek. I don't remember. Here's another photo of our group. And um, also, I, I didn't have any water. And as we were hiking in the sun, in the dry air up the mountain, I remember getting really thirsty. So when we got up to the snow, right right here, there, there was water melt running out under the snow into a stream. And I figured that that water was probably safe to drink. And uh, so I can remember dipping my hands in the water and, and drinking it. And I, I didn't get sick. Um, and um, so I guess it was safe to drink. So let's see. Here's another photo outside in Bishkek. There might be more here for you to recognize where this photo might have been taken. And uh, so there's Yaroslavsky again right there. Um, here we were, um, this was near or in Ala Archa, I don't remember. And uh, these people had uh, a yurt or tent I don't know if it has to be round to be a yurt. Um, and they were uh, they were there. A little story there is we were on a bus going to Ala Archa to do that hiking. And um, the uh, as we were going along in the bus, we had taken with us box lunches. We had you know a little cardboard box that had a. Uh, some food to eat, an apple in it, and uh, you know whatever. And so we all had these 
box lunches and we're on the bus and we're going along the bus and we see this guy. I don't remember exactly which guy it was. I think it was this guy who was riding a horse. And uh, or maybe it was this guy. Um, and uh, so there's this guy riding a horse uh, along. And we were, like I said, we may have actually already been in Ala Archa. And so we told the bus driver to stop. And a couple of us got off the bus. And I brought the apple from my box lunch. And, and the guy riding the horse, of course, comes over to the bus. He was curious. And uh, I, I, you know, I didn't, didn't speak any language. You know, I didn't speak Russian, didn't speak Kyrgyz. And, you know, I used hand gestures to indicate um, that uh, we might want to ride the horse. Now, first, I took my apple and I offered it to his horse and he didn't object. And the horse ate the apple, as you might expect. And horse likes the apple, right? So I was not nice to this guy's horse. And uh, one thing that I joke about, um, uh, and uh, I hope you don't find it offensive, but I say that Kyrgyz like their horses more than they like their children. And um, so I gave this guy's horse an apple, and I sort of indicated with hand gestures, would he let me ride his horse? And he got off the horse, and I got on, and I rode around for, you know, two or three minutes. And then everybody on the bus who wanted to ride the horse rode the horse. So uh, that was uh, uh, it, that was our interaction. And then the guy pointed up the hill, and there was this tent. And, you know, that's where his family was, in the tent. And so we followed him up the hill to his tent. And so these people, I assume, were family. Here's his dog. These are, I don't know who this guy was. Maybe he was in the family too. Uh, this guy was in the family. Here's the, uh, the guy from Soviet Georgia. And uh, he was in our group and he was in our group. And uh, I don't know who this guy was. He wasn't in our group, but Notice, as soon as we started taking the, uh, uh, as soon as whoever took the photo took the photo, this guy is sort of staring off in the distance, like the cl a classic pose there. So uh, now this, uh, let me show, here's another photo uh, in Bishkek. Like I said, maybe you might recognize a, this building or something to know what it is. Uh, now I want to show you it uh, looks like the Kyrgyz Philharmonic Hall or the Frunze Museum. Well, okay. One of them. Yeah, that's quite possible. Uh, you know, because you know they were taking us into large government buildings. So, um, um, this photo is interesting, and I'll tell you why in a moment. This is back in Ala Archa, and. Uh, so I'm standing there, and this is sort of a, a stream bed and sort of pointing my hand off into the distance. Here's this mountain here. And I want you to look at this mountain. Uh, notice, this, like I said, this was in summer. So notice the snow on the mountain there. Now, um, a year ago this past March, when uh, I came with with my wife and with Mara, and we, when, when we visited uh, UCA to see if Mara was interested in coming to UCA, you know, for um, last year. So we all went there, flew there, and um, I told uh, my wife and Mara uh, that they should visit Ala Archa National Park. So they got a ride out there and they visited. Okay, so this was a photo of me 37 years ago in Ala Archa. And then I wasn't with 
my wife and Mara. And by some chance, here's a picture taken with my wife. It's in exactly the same place. This was in the end of February, beginning of March. This was winter. Here's the mountain. And the mountain has not nearly as much snow on it. So this is the mountain today in winter. This is the mountain 37 years ago in summer. So I'll give you some idea of the effect of global warming. And um, so and I just, just get two more photos I want to show you is that, uh, you know, I always tell people, joke with people, maybe you've heard of the, the uh, actor in the United States, George Clooney. He's in, in several movies, maybe not. But, you know, he's supposed to be a good looking fellow. Here's his picture. I tell people that I'm George Clooney's doppelganger. You know, doppelganger is a person who has an identical appearance. For example, identical twins would be doppelgangers. I tell people I'm George Clooney's doppelganger. So here's me. Here's George Clooney. Here's me. Here's George Clooney. I'm sure you can see the strong resemblance. Um, okay. I can't see any difference. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's amazing, isn't it? Um, people often confuse me with George Clooney on the street. Um, okay. Now, I've wasted enough time here. Let me... Um, uh, uh, let me talk a little bit uh, 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 about some uh, properties of Excel that I find very useful. And that's a, so uh, let me pull. I opened an Excel spreadsheet here somewhere. All I got to do is find it. Here it is right here. OK, now. Um, See if I can remember how to do all this stuff. And um, okay, so this is, uh, I just have this here to remind me what, what I'm supposed to be doing. So uh, the first thing I wanna show you is that if I wanted to put down a list of numbers in, uh, in a column and not have to type them all in, and the numbers have some property, um, uh, some repetitive property. So let me open up a new spreadsheet here. New, there. Let me uh, let me increase view. Do two hundred percent. Make it bigger so you can see there. Okay. Now, the, um, the first thing. Uh, this is. Uh, I want. I want Excel to automatically put in the numbers with little effort, because if you're always having to retype regular patterns of numbers, it takes a long time. In particular, there are some cases in Excel where I've done some examples where I might have 100,000 rows going down here, and I wanna have numbers in all these 100,000 rows, and having to type in everything would be impossible. So. First off, if I just wanted to put a constant here, and um, so uh, I'll pick an easy constant, the number one. So if I want to put number one down throughout the entire row, uh, now, or let's say not not the entire row, because the entire row in, in theory would go forever, but let's say I want to put number one all the way down to 10. I can type in one in here like that, and then I click back up here and I go to the corner and I click on the corner and I drag it down to 10. And one, all I get all ones in there. That's really convenient. But suppose I don't want all ones. I want one, two, three, and all so on all the way down. So how do I do that? Well, let me delete this here and now. So I put a one here. And uh, this is an autofill feature in, uh, in Excel. And now I put a two here. 
So I want to go one, two, and then three, four, five, 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 and so on. So I click. Now, two ways I can choose. I want to choose both cells. I can click and then shift click there. That chooses both cells. Or I can click, I can click and then drag. And that will choose the both cells. Either way, now I grab the corner and I go down. Notice just to the right of the arrow, I don't know if you can see it on your screens or not, there's a small number three, now number four, now number five. That's telling me what's going to show up in that cell. Now, when I let go of the mouse button, they're all filled in. But not with all ones, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. Okay, now let me go down a little bit more. Here, that go down to twenty. That's far enough. Okay, now I want to. So this uh, the autofill feature in Excel, and there's there's more to it. You can do a lot more with autofill, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And I've added a video onto my syllabus. And I uh, emailed out and posted an updated syllabus too. So uh, if you, you might want to check that. Uh, I've added a video all about autofill. It's a video that somebody else did. It's not mine, but it, it's really good. So um, now one other thing, characteristic that I use a lot, and this is basically fundamental to computer programming. And, and that has to, the, those are if statements. I want to check to see if something is true or not. And if something is true, I want to do one thing. And if it's not true, I want to do something else. Um, for uh, example, if I'm in a self-driving car, and the car has cameras and other sensors that are viewing the terrain around the car. The car is driving forward. Um, if the car sees an obstacle in front, you want to stop. And um, so there might be some software built in looking at the data coming in from the sensors and if the car senses an obstacle, you want to stop. But if it doesn't sense an obstacle, you keep on going. So, I mean, without if statements, any computer software would be probably near useless. So these they're called if then else statements. Sometimes you just use the if part. Uh, sometimes you use a couple of if parts together and so on. So. This is in Excel. Without if then else statements, like I said, Excel would be much less useful. So let me give you an example of that here. So I'm going to go into column B here, and I'm going to put an if statement. I'm going to look at these numbers in column A. And if the numbers are, let's say, less than or equal to 10, I want to do one thing. But if they're greater than or equal to 10, I want to do something else. So um, let's uh, say these are measures of IQs of political leaders. So if the IQ is between 1 and 10, I want to put Trump here. And if the IQ is greater than 10, I want to put Putin here. OK, and uh, so I'm going to do that with an if then else statement. So I click on this cell right here. Now I can add, add an equation. Now look up here while I'm tight while I'm typing here. I put an equal sign because I'm going to put in a built-in function. And if you don't start with an equal sign, Excel doesn't realize you're putting in a function. So notice the equal sign appears here, and it appears here. I can type either up here or down here now. So I want to put an if then else statement and I can actually type what I want either up here or down here. So I'm going to type if now all the functions in Excel are uppercase letters. But 
usually you can you don't have to type uppercase you can type lowercase and if it's a legitimate function excel just automatically switches the case to uppercase so do if and now i'm going to put it in parentheses so i'll put open parentheses now what i want to do is i want to look at what is in cell a here a1 cell a1 i want to say if a1 is uh, I can, let me, let's say if it's greater than 10, I want to type Putin. And if it's less than 10, I want to type Trump. So I do if, and I hit A1, and now I put uh, greater than, and I'll put 10. So if A1 is greater than 10, I said I want to type Putin. So I'll put a comma. And then I put inside quotes, I put quote and Putin and end quote. So if A1 is less than 10, I'm going to type the word Putin. But if it's not less than 10, I want to type the word Trump. So, I mean, sorry, if it is greater than 10, I want to type Putin. If it's not greater than 10, I want to type Trump. So... T-R-U-M-P, oh, I forgot to put the quotes. Like I said last time, I make lots of mistakes. Trump, that's the difference between me and all your other professors. Um, they don't make mistakes. Uh, Putin, Trump, and now I'll end up with a parentheses. So what should happen here is if A1's greater than 10, the word Putin should be typed in the cell. If it's not greater than 10, the word Trump should be typed in the cell. So I'll hit return. And there it's one, so I get Trump. Now I want to put that exact same thing in all of the cells down to 20. So I want to check what's in the adjacent A cell and see if it's greater than 10 or not. So I click here, go to the corner, and drag down like this. So indeed, now when I first wrote it, I typed A1. But notice as I go down, let's say I go here, it now says A2. So Excel automatically changes the cell reference to whatever is next here. And that is tremendously convenient but sometimes it causes problems, and not today, I don't think, um, but in, in, in the videos I, I talk about later, I talk about how to deal with those problems. I, I don't think I'm going to get to it today. We'll see. Okay, so notice whenever this number here is, le is less than or equal to 10, notice here equal to 10, I get Trump, and greater than 10, I get Putin. Now, I could have put this in differently. I could have changed this to up here. I could say if A1 is greater than 10, if A1 is greater than 10, um, what, uh, notice it's not equal, it's only greater than. So let's see what happens there when I do that. So this still says Trump. So be, why? Because this isn't greater than 10. So I get Trump. Now, let, let's see. Let me change this. Let me do uh, greater than or equal to. There. Greater than or equal to 10. Okay, so I should get, if it's equal to 10, notice down here, if it's equal to 10, I'm getting Trump. I want to get Putin if it's equal to 10. So I hit return. Now at 10, well, oh, it didn't take that equal. Darn. Let me let me do this. Uh, you know, it did take the equal, but there. Like I said, I make mistakes. Um, there. A1 greater than or equal to 10. This is A2, this, I want to do A1. 
So A2 is for this one. A1 greater than or equal to 10, Putin, Trump. Okay, now let me drag this down. Okay, so A1 is greater than or equal to 10. Notice when A1 is when A, whatever is in A here, which is in this case, it's A10. A10 is greater than or equal to 10. I get Putin. So you can put greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to, whatever you want in there. Now, I may not want to put a word. Um, you know, with Excel, we're mixing words and numbers and whatever. And um, I may not want to put a word. I may want to put a number. So let's say, let's come back up here. Let's say if A1 is greater than or equal to 10. I just want to put the number zero in the cell. So I'll put zero. And I want to put another number here. I'll put one. So if A1 is greater than or equal to 10, I type the number zero in the cell. If it's not, I type the number one and I hit return. So now I get the number one here. Now I drag this down to 20. And as soon as the A, the number in A is equal to 10, I'm now typing a zero and not a one. So this can come in, uh, this is really important if you ever do any more sophisticated computer programming, it's important, but it's even important for simple things like this uh, and um, our simple Excel examples where you want to check to see if something is true or not true and then change the out the result you know for example perhaps we have a list of people's ages here and you want to check the people over a certain age you want to do one thing and people not over that age you want to do something else so you want to want to check to see all the people and the ages may jump around they may not be in order right the ages don't want might not necessarily be in order so uh, uh, so these if then, uh, so we have if, if this is true, and if it's true, we do zero. If it's not true, we do one. So that's if then else. Okay. Um, now let's see, what else do I want to do here? Okay. Heads and tails. So this is a kind of a simple example. And uh, in statistics, when you took statistics, and uh, most people, most students don't like statistics. And uh, I, uh, I kind of uh, am mixed on that. I, the statistics as they usually teach it, I don't like. Uh, if I, if my first statistics course was like that, um, I wouldn't like statistics, but I actually never took statistics until I was in graduate school and it was it was a, 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 a advanced course on statistics uh, based on abstract probability theory and I found that much more interesting than the way they usually teach teach st statistics uh, in school and um, and that's what sort of directed me to like statistics and to continue studying in statistics. Um, in my PhD, one of my minor areas, um, back where I went to graduate school, we had a, a major area where we did our dissertation, and then we had to have two minors. And one of my minors was statistics, and my other minor was mathematics. So I, I uh, did my major area in information sciences and systems. Um, and uh, which at that time was primarily digital signal processing. And then I did my minors in mathematics and statistics. And I never took a statistics course until I got to graduate school. 
Okay, so let's talk about statistics in Excel. So I'm going to go over here to D. And uh, first of all, I want to generate some random numbers. And uh, virtually every piece of computer software, every software language of which I am aware, and every spreadsheet program has a way of generating random numbers. Um, and uh, what I like about, one of the things I like about that, in particular I like about Excel, is that you can, you can do statistical experiments in Excel using the fact that you can generate random numbers. So you could generate a bunch of random numbers to simulate something, and then uh, you can investigate the statistics of those random numbers to get some idea what might be happening. And I'm going to do a really simple example here. I'm going to do a simulation of flipping a coin looking for heads or tails. Okay, so someone told you flip a coin a thousand times and tell me if it's, uh, you know, how many times heads comes up or tails. I mean, if you actually had to flip a coin a thousand times, your thumb would get tired. So uh, we can do experiments like that in Excel. So again, I'm going to put a function in here and I begin all functions with an equal sign. So equal. Now Excel generates random numbers. And uh, in the simplest way is with this rand function. So I type rand and I hit enter and and okay now turns out that I made a mistake here because the rand function has to have I'll go back up here now has to have an open and closed parentheses. That's because we can put something in between the parentheses and change the properties of the function, but I'm not going to do that right now or talk about it. So this is a random number that Excel generated. And the random number is uniformly distributed between zero and one. And uh, I hope you remember that because you almost surely covered it in your probability and statistics course, what a uniformly distributed random number is. That is, the number is equally likely to be any number in the interval between zero and one. And um, so here's the function here, rand, which does that. And so what I want to do is generate random numbers all the way down, and I use autofill. I'll click on the corner, and I drag it down here to 20, and it puts in the random function. So there, here's the random function. Here, it's in every cell as I drag it down here. Okay, now, um, if every number is equally likely, the numbers between zero and one half are just as likely as the numbers between one half and one. So, like I said, I'm trying to simulate a coin toss. So I say, OK, if the numbers are between zero and a half, I'm going to take that to be a heads. And if the numbers are between one half and one, I'm going to take that to be a tails. So I can use an if then else statement to do that. And let me show you. I'm going to click here, right here on this. And I'm going to put an equal again because I'm putting in a function. And if, if, open parentheses. So I'll look at whatever this number is. So I cl just click on the cell that puts in cell D1. So if D1 is less than 0 0.5, I could just put in 0 0.5, but I'll put 0 0.5. It's, it's better practice. People like that. Um, 0 0.5. If D1 is less than 0 0.5, let's say I want to type heads. So I'll put, whenever I'm putting in text, I have to use quotations. So I put H and then end quote 
now a comma. And if D1 is not less than a half, I want to put in tails. So I'll put another quote and tail, quote, layer. So if D1 is less than a half, I want to put heads in this box. Otherwise, I want to put tails. I hit return, and there it is. I got tails. Now I want to do that same function all the way down. So I click on the corner, and I drag it down, and there we go. So let's check to see if it's working right. Here it's less than a half. I get heads. Here it's greater than a half. I get tails. Less than a half, I get heads. So it appears to be working right. You know, go down to some random place. Here it's greater than a half. I get tails. Okay, I'm happy with that. So there's an example of using random numbers. I copy the function all the way down using autofill. I put in an if statement looking at the random number to make some decision. And then I copy that function all the way down using autofill. So I hope you're beginning to see the significance of autofill. Now, I could, for example, compute the number of heads. Now, how might I add up the number of heads? Um, well, if I were doing it, and it's not not to say everyone would do it th this way. One thing you you should learn as we go through here is usually there are multiple ways of doing the same thing. And that's true in any computer programming. There are usually multiple ways of doing exactly the same thing. Now, once some people might have another put another if statement in here to see if what's in this box is heads, and if it is, do something. But what I want to do is go back to this if statement right here. I'm going to say, if D1 is less than a half, instead of heads, I'm going to put one. And instead of tails, I'm going to put zero. Hit return. So now, so, let me come back up here. If D1 is less than a half, I put out a one. If it's greater than a half, I put out a zero. Here it's greater than a half, I get a zero, so that's looking right. Now I click on the corner and I drag it down. And let's look at these numbers. Greater than a half, zero. Greater than a half, zero. Less than a half, one. Greater than a half, zero. So this looks like these numbers are coming in right. So I get ones and zeros. Now, remember that all the ones corresponded to what I had as heads. So if I sum up all the ones, I know how many heads are there. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to type equals sum. OK, and now I'm going to put open parentheses. And the first number I want to sum is this number. So I go back up here and I click on this. So E1 is the first number right here. And I'll put a comma. And then the second number I want to put in is down here. And if I could just type rather than click on it, I could just type E20. Now, no, I'm going to, I should actually type an uppercase E, but I'm going to type a lowercase E. Let's see, E20, like that. And then I'll close parentheses. Notice how whatever I type up here is appearing down here. Now I'll hit return, and it has, um, well, it looks like something didn't work right here. E1, oh, I know, I put a comma. I think I should have put, I may, I may have done the, I may need to put a colon instead of a comma there when I do want to sum up all the numbers. I think if I put a comma, it just sums the numbers E1 and E20. If I put a colon, it sums up all the numbers. Notice, well, as soon as I put a colon there, all of these cells got selected. So that's what I needed to put was a colon. Now I'll put return. Now it's 
adding up all the ones. It says it's nine. Let's add them up by hand. And let me just emphasize this. As long as I have been programming anything in computer language, in Excel or whatever, I always run simple examples and check the answers by hand as a way to see if the program is working properly. So this says the sum should be nine. So let's add them. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that's it all the way down to here. So nine. Now I could, let me just add the word sum here. Here. So I, I could put sum and then equal to like that return. Now I have the sum all the way over here. Suppose I want to move sum all the way over to the right hand side. I click back up here on that. Now I go up to home. And this is left justified. This is justified in the middle. This is right justified. So I want it right justify and I click on that and it moves this over. Now, maybe I want this left justified here so I can click on that. So there I have sum equals seven. So maybe you think that looks better, maybe not. But that's how you can move things around uh, text and numbers around inside a cell. So notice something else. Now it's seven and not nine anymore. So uh, what I usually do because I'm lazy is, is that I can regenerate a whole new set of random numbers. Um, and I can do that. I, all I have to do is just say, go over here, click on some cell over here, and I type something, one, and I hit return, and it generates a new set of random numbers. Okay, I'll hit another number, hit return, generates another set of random numbers. And hit return. Okay, that's the lazy way to do it. I, there's there's some way to have it automatically regenerate. I have to, I have to check it exactly to see what that is because I'm lazy and I usually do it this way. Um, now, notice, by the way, because these numbers are random and it's a simulated coin toss, I wouldn't expect to get the same number of heads every time. But... I would expect if heads and tails are equally likely, I would expect to get approximately the same number of heads and tails. So this number should, since there are a total 20, this number should always hover around 10 or 11, right? And in fact, that's exactly what it's doing. So I can generate a whole bunch of random experiments and see what the likelihood is that I get a very large or a very small number. I put, I generate another. There's 10 exactly, another one. There's 12, 9, 10. And of course, in statistics, one of, there's 9 again, 12, 13. So one of the open big questions in, in statistics, if you discussed it, is that, if I have something that's random, um, how do I know the likelihood of getting that random number or a values within some range of that random number? And um, that gets into this whole area of hypothesis testing that you may have looked at in statistics. So. One of the things that I like using Excel for is basically to do these random experiments. In other words, how many times am I going to generate a number between 8 and 12 when I do this? And how many times will I get a number outside that range? Because the number of heads could be as high as 20. And uh, it, could be as, it could be as low as zero. Uh, so an interesting question you could ask is how many times do I have to do this experiment before I get a 20? And uh, it's actually pretty high, uh, and it's not hard to compute that probability. Um, and um, 
you know, what's because to get a zero here, I have to get tails on every toss. And the probability of getting a tails is a half. So the probability that this is a tail is a half. The probability that this is a tail is a half. The probability that both are tails is a half times a half or a fourth. So a fourth of the time, both of these numbers should be zero. And I could do that. Of course, I may do it 100 times and both of them won't come up to be zero again, but one, there's zero, one, zero, zero, there's one, one, zero, zero, zero. So there was half the time, another one. So you see there's two ones. I mean, because it's random, even though in general, fourth of the time they should, they sh I should get um, two zeros. In practice, that won't happen every time I do the experiment. So if I wanted to know what are the odds of getting 20 zeros, that would be one half to the 20th power. Now let's see, one half to the 10th is one divided by 1,024. I happen to know that because uh, one half to the 10th is one over two to the 10th. And if you're a computer geek, you, you know powers of two, right? Uh, two squared is four, two cubed is eight, two to the fourth is 16, two to the fifth is 32. And it's because you use powers of two all the time. And I just happened to remember the two to the 10th is 1,024. And two to the 20th is one over two to the 10th times one over two to the 10th. And it's one over two to the 20th. And uh, so that would be one over two to the 10th squared, which would be one divided by 1,024 squared. And 1,024 squared is approximately a million right? Because a thousand squared is a million. So the odds of getting all zeros is approximately one in a million. And I'm not going to do that experiment. Uh, I hope you forgive me. Okay, so, um, but we can do random experiments. So if you're taking statistics uh, and you want to do random experiments, you can do them in Excel. And um, there are other cases where you might want to know uh, random values. Uh, you want to know uh, what are, you can have a list of names down here. And you want to know how many names begin with A. The letter A, we could use if statements to figure that out and then figure out how, then how many names begin with the letter A. And I'm not going to do that example right here and offhand. I, I, I'm not sure how to do it. I have to check how to see we uh, how we can determine whether the first letter in a word is an A or not. I could tell you if if it's just the letter A, but I'm not quite sure how to do if the first letter is A. I'd have to look at that. Okay, now let's see other things about autofill, and then uh, I'll be uh, I think I'll be done for today. If I want to. And you know this is really convenient. Suppose I wanted to put the months of the year down here, and I can type January. There's January, and I put want to put January, February, March, April, May, all the way down. I just type January. Excel will automatically recognize that's a month, and if I drag here, see there's the word February there, March, April, so it it automatically fills in the months of the year. I don't have to spell it out. I could just put the abbreviation for January, J-A-N, there. Now do the same thing. Click here, drag down, and it fills in the abbreviation. So it turns out there are actually lots of things where Excel will automatically fill in the rest of what you want to do. And so I put in the syllabus a link, and here's the link that I put into the syllabus. Let me expand this out right here. This link is to 
a great YouTube video that this uh, fellow put up on, on how, what the kinds of things you can do in autofill. And I'll click on it right here. Florida homeowners. Here's an advertisement. You can get paid to go solar. So in this video, and here's the video. How to use the autofill feature to quickly populate cells. So first, let's zoom in so you can. So he's doing autofill, do lots of things. Some of them I talked about. Some of them I didn't talk about. So this is a useful video to look at. Okay. So there is. Um, that's I wanted to talk about today. It's sort of a, a selection of useful features, how to put in if statements and how to use if statements, and and and, and even more time uh, I spent. In fact, every example I think was using autofill to do something, and uh, without autofill, Excel would be extremely tedious to use. So. You almost always are using autofill when you're doing things in Excel. So, uh, any questions on this? I've been talking for almost an hour, and I'm I'm going to end now, unless people have some questions. Um, I'm urging you uh, to uh, look at the syllabus, look at the videos on the syllabus. And um, and do the homeworks. Remember, I'm asking you to get your homeworks turned in by midnight on uh, Sunday, Kyrgyz time. And um, why is that? Because that midnight Kyrgyz time on Sunday, for me, will be midday on Sunday, so I can look at your homeworks and then grade them on Sunday. So that's what I want to do. So it's, if you can, if you're going to be late for some reason, send me an email and tell me um, you're going to be late and you'll get your homework in by, and tell me when you'll get your homework in. And the reason why I ask that is because if I'm grading the homeworks and giving people grades, it's much easier for me to be consistent in my grading if I'm doing all the homeworks at the same time. If I get homeworks out of time, um, it, it's uh, it's not impossible, but it's more of a challenge for me to be consistent. So I'm asking you to help me in that way. Try to get your homeworks in on time. But for some reason, it's not going to happen. An emergency has come up. Uh, you weren't expecting or something else happened. Just let me know. Um, also, uh, a few days ago, I sent an email and I asked people to take a selfie and send it to me. And I, I want you to do that so I know what you look like. And maybe I'll remember some of your names, you know, I'll look and see what your picture is and see what your name is. You know, I need everything because I'm old. I need everything to help me remember stuff. So um, that's uh, that's all I have to say for today. I may go back here. Oh, wow. Look at look at all these people, wonderful people. Um, and um, so. If you have any questions, ask me now. Uh, otherwise, send me an email or something, and I'll try to answer your question. So I guess the next time I will talk with you otherwise will be uh, next week on Tuesday. Okay? Uh, the sun's up. I can see the sun hitting the treetops. I have some woods right out my window here at the back of my house. And I can see the sun just hitting the treetops in the woods. It's really hot in Florida this time of year. And, uh, and, and what makes it even worse is the high level of humidity. It's like being in a sauna. 
Okay. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so last time you said that you have a YouTube channel and you're going to upload uh, these videos to YouTube channel? Yes, I, I've yes, done that. I've done that. Uh, what's your YouTube channel's name? Okay. okay. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, um, let me, uh, let me share screen again and then I'll type it out. I can email um, it to you. I what? guess we have the videos on the syllabus, right? We yeah, can find them have, there. You have videos on the syllabus and I'm sure you can find the YouTube channel from that. Uh, and then these videos I'm also putting on the YouTube channel. And, uh, but, you know, as long as you're here, I can, uh, I, I can I, I can show you what it is to avoid you're having to look at that. Let me share my screen again. OK, you should all see my screen now I'll pull up a text editor here. Here. So this is from my syllabus here. OK. OK, now. Um, my, I'm writing down the name of the channel, Avalon, My Avalon Photography. My Avalon Photography. Let me make this a larger type. Oh, wrong way. Okay, now let me sh show you what you put that in. Copy. Let me pull up a browser here. Now I go into YouTube. There's YouTube. I guess I already was in YouTube. Now I type my Avalon. My Avalon photography. I hope I spelled it right. I'm genetically incapable of. So th this is selling something that's an ad these are my videos here and um here i go in my channel i'll go into my channel here so these are my videos my avalon photography um this is my video from tuesday's lecture um this is not related to our course at all. This is a chemistry problem I did for my for Mara's study group in chemistry because their professor told them something that I thought was mistaken. And Mara and I got into, shall I say, an argument about it. So uh, I made uh, this video so she could here send the let link me, let me to her reflect. professor. Uh, and see if what if he was right or if I was right. Um, and then these are more videos for the course. These are processing videos, which we will get to later in the semester. You have to go way down here to get to my Excel videos. And these uh, this is still processing. Here's Excel videos down here because just as I do videos are popping up here in order and which is why I put links to the videos on the syllabus. So you could just click on the syllabus and the video would come up, come up. But the links to the day to day courses are not on the syllabus. So I take the video, I download it from Teams, I submit it to in YouTube and YouTube compresses the video. I mean, this video might be gigabytes when it comes out of teams and when I put it on YouTube, it compresses the video by a factor of 10. So those of you who might be doing your. Um, your Internet, your Internet provider may charge you by the by the bit. Um, looking at the videos off of YouTube saves you a lot of money. So uh, I put them on YouTube. They they're greatly compressed but I think they're really still good quality. So 
My Avalon Photography. That is my YouTube channel. And um, so uh, it's not what you would expect, right? So um, is that is that a good enough answer? Yes, thank you. OK, well, there are no more questions. I'm done. And you guys uh, have a next few days. Enjoy the rest of your classes, OK? Manisha, I have a question. I have a question. Oh, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. I have a question about the homework. Yeah. Uh, uh, could you elaborate what we need to do? Like we watched the YouTube video, but we need to do whatever you have you have already done, right? Yes. But we just need to do it on our own. I just want you to do what I have already <laughs> done. Yeah. That's all, okay, but thank you. I haven't completely explained everything, so you're going to have to try to figure some things out on your own. And um, so, like I said, first class, I'm interested in that. And I'm uh, in, you know, I'll be honest with you. I don't really care if you get exactly the right answer on everything. What I care is that you've tried to do something. Is if you guys are like me, and and if you are, you have been cursed by God. Um, you make more mistakes than you get things right. I'm interested that you have the technique down and you understand the technique. Um, and getting the right answer is secondary. So I would just want to really see. Have you tried to do it? That's what I'm interested in. So that's it. Any uh, any more questions? And then we have to send you the Excel document, right? Yes, yeah, send me the Excel document. Attach it onto your email. Send it to me and put your name on the file. That way, you know, I'll collect all the files. I'll put them in a folder and then I'll go through them one at a time and grade them. And uh, if your name is on the file, it simplifies that for me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, guys. Um, and um, one thing too, if you find you're being overwhelmed by things and are not understanding things, um, let me know. Send me an email, let me know, okay? Um, and. Uh, uh, if I can do something to help, I will. Oh. Okay, guys. Thank take, you. Yeah, take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.